Neville Goddard Lecture, A Movement Within God, given on the 16th of October, 1967. If you find yourself miserable or helpless here, may I tell you that you are not condemned to the state by a deity outside of yourself, for everything that takes place in your world is but a movement within God. We are told that in the very beginning the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and things came into being. Everything, your misery, your helplessness, your joy, your sorrow, no matter what it is, comes into being by a movement within God, and He is not a deity outside yourself. You are not a helpless being, but the operant power of God. Seated as you are now, you can move without moving physically because your eternal body is all imagination. Called Jesus Christ in Scripture, you are God's power and wisdom. So if you find yourself in a place where you are miserable and feel helpless, it is because you either knowingly or unknowingly fell into that state, and not because of the condemnation of some deity outside of you. Every conceivable situation that you could ever think of exists now as a fact in God, but cannot be made visible to you until you occupy it, for you are God's operant power. Everything in this world needs man as the agent to express it. Hate or love, joy or sorrow, all things require man to express it. We glorify or condemn the man, but he simply represents a state which God entered knowingly or unknowingly and remained there until the state was externalized. Everyone is free to choose the state he wishes to occupy. You imagined yourself into your present state. If you don't like it, you must imagine yourself out of it and into another. It is all a matter of movement. We are told that He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Collectively forming one glorious being, we conceived a play and speaking as one being. We said, it is time for the play to begin. Then individually we said, I am, and the play began. We conceived a play containing every horrible thing as well as every lovely thing in the world. Every problem and its solution were conceived. In fact, you cannot think of something that was not in that original conception. Then, it was time to start, and saying simply, I am, God took upon himself that which he had conceived, and your journey into this fabulous world began. So no matter what you are experiencing now, you are not condemned by some being outside of yourself, for you either wittingly or unwittingly fell into the state, be it good, bad, or indifferent. Now how to move? We are told in the very beginning of Genesis that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And in the book of Joshua, which is the Hebraic name for Jesus, the Lord said, Wherever the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. Now you can choose where you want the sole of your foot to tread, for the world is yours and all within it. But remember, whatever you tread upon will be given you. When I speak of Joshua or Jesus, I am not speaking of any historical creature, but the Christ in you who is the hope of glory. I am trying to get you to realize that Jesus Christ is in you as your own wonderful human imagination. So when I say, God became man that man may become God, I mean imagination became you that you may become all imagination. Man has difficulty associating imagination with God. Somehow the word God denotes some being that created the world yet remained apart from it. But when I use the word imagination, it is my hope that the separation ceases to be. May I tell you, the whole vast world is all imagination. Our realists think they are nearer to the truth, yet they do not realize they are dictating nothing more than their imagination. They laugh at those who are mystically inclined. But may I tell you, leave them alone and go your way in confidence that what you are imagining you already are, you will become. You imagined yourself into the state you are now occupying, and you can imagine yourself into any state you desire to express. No outside deity moved you into the state of misery you are now expressing. You did it yourself because you forgot who you are. You are the being who conceived every state in the beginning and deliberately started your journey by moving into a state. For you are Jesus, the Lord. When I speak of Jesus, I am not speaking of some holy person as the world calls holy. The true story of Jesus is not as the churches teach. Their teaching is as far removed from the truth as Dante's Inferno is from the Sermon on the Mount. Dante had the capacity to spin beautiful worlds together, but what a state he fell into when he wrote his words. He was supposedly writing scripture, and that is what the churches follow, yet it is so completely different from the real true story of Christ. 
Jesus is the very being of everyone in the world. The word Jesus means Jehovah saves, and there is only one Savior. Jesus is he who fell, and he who saves himself. No one else saves you. You are saved by your own being. Becoming aware, you begin to remember, and remembering, you turn around and come out of the very play in which you sent yourself. And in the end, all are united to form once again the single being that fell. The Lord God Jehovah, containing all, fell into diversity. In the end, not one will be lost, but all will be gathered into the unity that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the story. This week I received some beautiful letters. One was from a lady who said, I heard you ten years ago, and shortly after hearing your message, I found myself in vision on top of the highest mountain in the universe. I was looking towards the horizon into a fantastic vastness without a shore. Clouds were below me, but as I looked into the distance, I saw a little flicker of light, then a spark, and then others. As I watched the flickering lights round about me, I noticed that the cloud below me was making an imperceptible forward motion. Then a burst of white light came through the clouds and filled infinity. The clouds began to disperse, and pointing to the light, I said, That's Paul. Then the light diffused, and a burst of light appeared in living colors, and pointing to it, I said, That is Neville. Then came a shower of golden needles which penetrated my brain, and I awoke to write it down. For years I have contemplated this vision, not understanding its meaning until last Monday night, when you spoke of the being of light who shoots his fiery arrows into the brains of those who are called. May I tell you, it's the same story over and over again. You are the only Christ, the only Lord, the only God and Father of all. Having conceived the play, you are playing every part, and each in his own wonderful time will play the part of Jesus Christ, for in the end we will all know that we are God. Then you will hate no one, for you will realize that we agreed to play all the parts while hiding behind the masks we wear. Now completely masked, we think we are many, and do not recognize ourselves as the one who conceived and predicted the play of life. You are not now in a fatalistic state. You fell into the state because it was arranged in the beginning that you could fall into and move out of every state. So keep on going and complete the play, for when the play is finished, you turn around and return to the very being you were in the beginning. Now, a gentleman wrote, saying, I saw a man about twenty-six years of age. He had golden curls on his head and seemed to be sunk into the ground. Two men appeared to be working on the top of his head towards the back of his skull. As I watched, the young man raised his arm, and touching his head, he put his hand into his skull. Curious, I came closer to see an enormous skull made of clay or some form of plastic which was completely empty. Moving to look at the front of the man, the scene changed, and now I see his chin resting on the sands of the desert. The mask looked like those shown in Africa or Hawaii, where you only see the mask, but never the wearer. I knew I was seeing a mask, but its wearer was unseen. That is the world. You don't know it, but when you are looking at a seeming other, you are seeing an intimate being, one you knew in the beginning, one you will remember when all of the masks are removed, for we are all wearing masks in order to play this play called life. In this world, imagination plays the role of the weak man, the strong man, the poor man, and the rich man. For the roles were conceived in the beginning by imagination, and imagination is playing all the parts. You, imagining, are God, who is all imagination. That's all there is. The universe is nothing more than imagination creating while it is fast asleep. You and I move from state to state, either deliberately by knowing what we are doing, or unintentionally by falling into a state as we read the headlines of the paper. Listen to the radio or watch TV tonight, and although you may know none of the facts, if you accept what is said, you will fall into a state and buy things you do not need. You will fill your house with all kinds of trivia that you have no room for because Imaginations is operating. Someone conceived a plan to get you to empty your pockets and buy their products, and you will, because Imagination is sound asleep and imagination will continue the journey until you turn around and head for home by becoming more and more awake. Those who think they are so very wise in this world know nothing about Jesus. 
Only the seers, the mystics, know who he is. Only those who have seen the light he claims he is and know his form without seeing the face know him. There are not thousands of lights, but only one vast infinite light. If one takes on a white light and another multicolored lights, it's still the same wonderful light of Jesus only. There is only God who is playing all the parts. And in the end, you will know that you are light, that you are spirit, that you are God from personal experience. But tonight, as you sit here, you can mentally shut out the facts of life and move anywhere in your imagination. Do that, and no one looking at you physically can tell where you have mentally moved. And if you dwell in imagination where you would like to be and see what you would see were you there, you will have moved within your own being. Persist and everything here will die because of your move within God. In the beginning, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, saying, Wherever you go and stand, I will give you. You were given everything in the beginning, and one day, having finished the play, you will begin to awaken. Then I, who came out first, will stand there as an anchor for all to come through by performing the same deed. You will be drawn by a fiery brooding upon this wonderful mystery, drawn to the risen Christ who is formed out of all. As you enter, we fuse, and the mortal you reassumes immortality. You fell into the mortal state in order to experience death, and when you turn around, you rise to become one with immortality. I tell you, you are the Lord God Jehovah who conceived the play and deliberately entered it. You did nothing wrong. It was an adventure, and without adventure, what is life? If someone left you a billion dollars so you could be cushioned for the rest of your life here, they would be robbing you of your creative adventure. In the beginning, you left all by emptying yourself of all that you were aware of being. Then you took upon yourself the form of a slave. Wearing a slave mask right now, no one knows who you really are, and you cannot recognize those who you have known throughout all eternity. Benny came to my home a week ago, and sitting beside him, I could see nothing but love pouring forth from him. I couldn't see his face, for his skin is dark. But when I looked at Benny, all I could see was the being of love I knew in eternity. In the beginning, we were all the Elohim, which is a compound unity of one made up of others. Benny has as dark a skin as I have ever seen on a man, and I am as fair as man can be, so you might think we came out of different beings. But these are only masks we wear. Benny has turned around and now knows he is the light of the world. He knows he is infinite love. May I tell you, when you see infinite love, you will see man. You will see he who is the gathering togetherness of all. I will know you by the light, and you will know me by the light, but when we know each other as one, it will be as love, and that is man. Everyone is gathered into the human form, divine. Not one will be lost, for in the beginning we agreed to dream this world into being, in concert. Then we went our separate ways to falling into different states of consciousness and blaming others for the discords in our world. That's all right, for one day we will return and all the discords will be resolved into perfect harmony as we expand beyond what we were prior to the play. You can put me to the test tonight by learning how to move. My brother Victor learned how to move into riches when he had nothing. Living on borrowed money and trying to operate a little shop on a side street Victor would stand before one of the largest buildings in the island and see J.N. Goddard and Sons on the marquee rather than the existing F.N. Roach and Company. This he did every day until the idea was fixed in his mind's eye. Two years later, the business failed. You may think that was wrong, but nothing is wrong in God's name. We ate of the tree of millennium and fell into right and wrong. When the building was put up for sale, a man we hardly knew bought it for my brother, and the sign was changed from F.N. Roach & Company to J.N. Goddard & Sons. What did my brother do? He moved his imagination. He had no money when he purchased the building in 1922. Now, in 1967, I don't think you could buy the family out for $25 million. I own 10% of the stock, but I do not know its value. I came here to tell you not how to make money, but how to operate the law of identical harvest so that if everything is taken from you tonight, you can rebuild it tomorrow. This is how it works. I imagined myself into what I am, and I can imagine myself into what I want to be. 
I am forever becoming what I imagine myself to be, be it good, bad, or indifferent. There is no deity on the outside who condemns and causes you to do what you are doing. You moved into the state you are now occupying either wittingly or unwittingly, for God and your own wonderful human imagination are one. So when you say, I and my father are one, you are speaking of your human imagination. I have been sent to clarify scripture and take off the barnacles off the story called Jesus Christ. This is a small beginning, but what does it matter? You who hear me will tell the story and bring it back to somewhere near its original form, for the story as interpreted by the churches of the world is not anything near the truth. This morning I read Buckley's column. I enjoy his use of words and I find him quite an interesting fellow. Today he wrote about the Bishop of Canterbury saying, I don't believe the good bishop would recognize a Christian if he met one, or scripture if he read it. I don't always agree with Buckley, but this time I agreed after reading what he quoted the bishop as having said. Now this is not only true of the present bishop, but of all the bishops I have met, whether they call themselves cardinals or popes, for their rituals, beliefs, and teachings are so far removed from the true story of Jesus. I'm here to tell you that God became you. How? By seeing the mask, one like you see in Africa or in Hawaii, and identifying himself with it. Now disguised as that which God wears, you can no longer see who you really are. But I tell you, the being behind the mask you now see as your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband and children, is a part of the Elohim who created the play and is playing every part. One day that being will take off the mask and you will resurrect and leave your empty skull. So I say to my friend, who saw the mask with the empty skull made of plastic, the day will come when you will ascend with one of us whose mask is already taken off and pointing to that skull, you will say of it, I once dwelt there. Then you will know as I do that you were never the mask you wore. And in eternity we will all know each other and all be enhanced beyond what we were by reason of the journey that we made. Tonight you try this, test it, learn how to move. The test is simple. Just like my brother, take a simple little thing like asking yourself, what do I want? Now, looking at the world as you now see it, if you had what you wanted, would you continue to see the world as it is now? I doubt it. It need not be a change from where you live, but if there were a change, you would see the world differently. And naturally, your closest circle of friends would see a changed you. Well, begin to move in God by seeing your world from a different angle and let your friends see you there. You are the operant power and move in your own being. If you move from where you are to where you would like to be, you could detect that motion only by a change of position relative to another object. Motion in itself cannot be done without some frame of reference from which it moves. If your income had just been increased to say $30,000 a year from your present income of less than $10,000, how would you feel? How would your present circle of friends see you? Would they know it? Would they discuss it? Would they speak of the change in your life? Tell them, and then eavesdrop and hear your friends discuss you as one who is now making $30,000 a year. That's a motion in God and that movement will produce results. Everything in this world is nothing more than the result of a movement in God, which is a motion in your wonderful imagination. The slightest imaginal act that is a change. I don't mean just an act, for you can imagine things you don't believe. But if you imagine something you believe is a change, a thrill is sent through divine being. At that moment, you have actually entered another state and made it alive and real in your world. Try it tonight. It costs you nothing, not even a nickel. But may I tell you that when you stand in the presence of the one being who is drawing all towards itself, you are sent into the world to tell them your fantastic story. And if they do not apply what you tell them, they become disillusioned and hate you who invited them to dream. I am sent to invite everyone to dream consciously, to dream deliberately, for this is a dream world. They say that where he comes, he is always rejected, for he tells man, whatever you desire, believe that you have received it and you will. Anyone who makes that bold assumption and gets the confidence of those whose sphere he reaches runs the risk of rejection. For when they try it and do not quite know how to do it, they become disillusioned and invariably hate the one who invited them to dream. That's the risk every teacher who is sent must run. But I tell you, it's true anyway. And if one fails to bring their dream into being and becomes embittered, 
I say to myself, how often must I tell them? Seventy times seven. I must tell them until they really understand, and those who hear me will carry my message forward. They will be heard, and in the end we will all be gathered back into the one being, to know that we were that one being who conceived the play and took the plunge. So when we said in the beginning, it is time for the play to begin, not one of us failed to respond in the first person present tense, I am. Now let us go into the silence. <laughs>